Hello, I am called the NYE. We are going to listen to Soludo on the second anniversary of his uh, being the governor of the chief judge of, of uh, the being the governor of Anambra State, Nigeria. So we are going to we are going to listen to him. Let's uh, hear from him. The former governors of Anambra State. I will not go in a strict order. I'm on a Mabronya if a protocol. Oh, but not forgetting the national chairman of the only progressive party, um, the pioneer progressive party in Nigeria. Uh, Remember to like, comment, on and turn on notification button um, and share. Chief and also subscribe. I am called the NYE, the, the son of wonderful. Let's wait. Let's watch the full speech of Soludo. Stay tuned. The Reverend Fathers, Sisters, the Bishops, and all the Reverends here. Anambra Zule is where back. The Anambra Ekenemo no. Anambra Pueno. Mono. Zono. Um, today, it's for us, for me actually, it's just another day. We weren't quite sure if we are going to have a celebration to mark this second year anniversary. If it had fallen on an ordinary day, we would have let it pass. In fact, we thought we were just going to use the day of the second year anniversary to go on with the commissioning that have been going on. But then somebody reminded us about two weeks ago that it falls on a Sunday. Quite frankly, I would have just gone on to the St. Patrick's Cathedral to have a normal church service and go home. But we thought that the people who wanted to attend wouldn't be able to contend in the cathedral. And so we decided to carry the Thanksgiving a normal mass on Sundays to this place. And I want to thank all of you, thank all of you who have made out your time from all over Nigeria, the clergy, my Lord Bishops, the Reverend Fathers, for officiating at this particular auspicious moment. Today is a day that we thought, and we've tried to make it as exclusive as possible for the Anambra, who are our employers. Two years ago, myself and my deputy, Dr. Nyeke Tubi Bezim, took oath of office as your chief servants who went to work as the bishop rightly said right away they will work for about eight hours and 45 minutes on the first day no form fair nothing the next day we were in Oboko and began the journey today we've come to report to you some aspects <coughs> of what we've been able to do given the context of the time that we came into office and given the challenges of the time. But in spite of it all, I want to say to all of you, in summary, that the state of Anambra, as has been <coughs> attested to by the bishop, uh, bishops, and Jifemeka Nyoko, the state of Anambra is strong. The state of Anapra is strong and is getting stronger and will be getting stronger as the years go by. Tomorrow we'll be back again in Oboko. We'll be back in Oboko to commission about 12 kilometers of road of the 15 kilometers already started. A pipe on water will be running in Oboko with the street lights and yes, 
for the first time in history, a general hospital will be opened in Okoko tomorrow. A few days ago, we were at our both family. The communities along that axis that have since the creation of Adam and Eve never saw a third road. And we saw the joy of the people. As we speak now, we are doing test runs of what we call Anambra statewide water scheme. It's not just about Oka. It's being test run in Oka. It's being test run in Onesha. It's being test run in Okoko. It's being test run in Okozo. It's being test run in other uh, Anewi and so on and so forth. Yes, we grew up with urban and rural water schemes with the dozens of the others. Yes, we'll be able to go from Amansi to Puma in a few days' time to commission that. Yes, we were at Onisha the other day. As I speak to you, the Ochanja roundabout is no longer a refuse dump. There is now water fountain there to signal our urban renewal. Yes, we move around the state. Where we are commissioning this, this and that at Onisha. The crowd was there applauding us and telling us that because we've gotten cows largely out of the markets and out of the streets in Onisha, today people now come back again from all over the country to shop in Onisha again and they are having money back in their pocket. Yes, BKK, please. Uh, thank you very much. We haven't got the time. We just have to, I mean, I just want to say a few things uh, to all of us, just to tell you that you employed us this job under some circumstances which we won't elaborate upon. But today, like I said, money is getting in the pockets of people. That's the testimony of the KK drivers. The bus driver at Onisha, who carried his entire earnings, the only thing that he earned for the day, to give to me, please, in appreciation. That his mechanic, his the, um, vehicles used to go for mechanic once every three days or so, but not anymore, and so on and so forth. And that the cost of maintenance now down, the cost of the affairs also, and that's the story we were told along the line. Those who are no longer paying school fees in schools, because we now have a truly free education in public schools, that's money back in the pockets of the people. Or those who are having free antenatal, free delivery in our public hospitals, that's money free in their pockets. All I want to say to you, dear friends, is that when we took over office, we told you that this is an agenda with a deadline. And being an agenda with a deadline, there are no excuses. No excuses whatsoever. Yes, we promised in the Anambra that we will be laying the foundation for us to move on, lay a foundation to have that, what we call African Dubai, Taiwan, Silicon Valley. Dubai as a hub for commercial and logistics. Taiwan as the economy that built on human capital resources to build a most powerful industrialized nation. And Silicon Valley, because our future lies in technology and innovation. That's the nexus of what we want to do, the Anambra of our vision. And we told you we want to build Anambra, lay the foundation for Anambra to become a smart mega city. But it has to be an international city to achieve our objective. It has to be that state where the citizens, if they choose to go anywhere else in the world, it will be by choice, but not under duress to build a livable and prosperous homeland. And we are armed with two major documents as our compass. Our manifesto, the People's Manifesto, and the other one, Anambra Vision 2070. 
armed with these two things, we began to walk. But it is just like his lordship said, you're not going to begin to uh, overnight, you'll have a Dubai, Taiwan, Silicon Valley, when you have criminals taking over eight local governments when we assumed office, and kidnapping and killings were daily occurrences. That's not on that condition you do that. You're not going to do that when you have filth and waste and so on, all over the streets and, and, and all over, where you have arboros take over the entire space of the land, or where about 35% of our land space is being threatened by gully erosion, and so on and so forth, and, and then the state of public finance as it were. We needed to pull back to get down to the fundamental basics. And what I want to say to you today, what do we present to you? We're not going to go into the full details of it. My people tried to put it together, and they came down with about maybe 100 and some, uh, 200 and something uh, items. I said, no, 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 go and cut it down to no more than 100 that we'll be able to share. We're going to get copies of them, but I'm going to now speak to just the nuggets of some of the highlights of what we have here. But I want to say to you, dear Nambra, as I said a moment ago, the state of Anambra is strong. Now, in terms of our journey so far, as is public knowledge, we have five major pillars. That's actually the pathway to the future. The pathway to today and that of the future. While we are trying to lay the foundation for the next generations, we are also mindful of today, because the people must live today. But let me share something very important with you. And like we said, no excuses. The times are challenging. And it is very important that we take this message away. You all know the challenges that we have, you know, that have come upon us in terms of the national economy, the exchange rates, the subsidy removal, which were inevitable disruptions that had to happen because we were in denial for so long. But having come on now, what is evident in their number is that the resources available to government today, the resources available to government today, and it is important that we all take this point home, happen to be a tiny fraction of what was available in years past. In fact, I went down the memory lane and I went back from 2004 to 2024. In terms of the annual, both coming from Abuja and everything, spending on year-on-year -year basis. Each year came to some hundreds of millions of U.S. dollars. Each year. In fact, it reached the peak of about $1.1 billion in 2013. Today, if you even go by the value, the purchasing power of money, Naira, then, on a monthly basis, Anambra was receiving between 34 or so a million U.S. dollars to 50-something, 60 in some cases, which if you do the conversion today, you'll be getting between 50-something to 70, 80 billion on monthly basis. Today, if the current trend continues, the current trend of what we've got in January, February, or even later last year continues, we might actually end up, at the end of the year, receiving less than $100 million, which will be, at the peak period, less than 10% of what Anambra got at the peak period, and at first times, maybe 20, 25, or even less percent in terms of the resources. When cement was costing a few hundred naira, and today you pay over 12,000 to do the same thing. 
when diesel was about a, less than a hundred, now you pay a thousand, six, a thousand, seven. But you still have to fuel the same vehicles and so on and so forth. We are intentional, very deliberate about doing more with less because we are facing an extraordinary difficult circumstance in Nigeria. But you know what? Tough times demand for tough managers and tough leaders. That's why we came. That's why you employed me. And that's why we decided to lay a template to say before we even go on, it is very attractive. Every governor that comes, you know, banks flood you with offers of borrowing and so on and so forth. But we decided for the first two years to demonstrate something, capacity to do more with less. And so far, as has been said, for two years, despite receiving about 25% in real terms or in dollar terms of what was in the past, we've chosen deliberately not to borrow. And people ask me, I know his law, my, my lordship, uh, Bishop Ezo Kabo, has asked me this question more than four times. How do you do it without borrowing and with the difficult circumstances? And my answer is that we are doing so because we are executing the most austere government ever. As I speak to you, I have not... I'm not, being, I'm, not, I'm not taking any salary, I'm not paid any salary by Anambra State Government. Even the First Lady of Anambra doesn't have any official car. She still drives my personal vehicle. We are executing the most austere government ever and directing resources, cutting waste, cutting the cut of governance to bare bones and directing resources, prioritizing them to what is the most important for the people. And so what you will say, us delivering, is that we are determined, at least if I don't, can do anything else, having been governor of the central bank and not just another governor who managed the resources of this country with annual budget of the central bank over $2 billion. Now I have to manage the one of Anambra with less than $200 million. a fraction of what was there in the past. We needed to demonstrate that it is possible. It is possible to give people basic value. Albeit that from this year, we will be changing gear. And when we change gear, Anambra, your hands in nothing yet. Yes, why still talking about this point is important for me to highlight because I think uh, his, uh, your Lordship, you did mention something which is part of the reason why we came. We are of the All Progressive Grand Alliance. Our motto is leave no one behind. If you see the way we have prioritized governance, we have given priority to all those neglected, those who are left behind. That's why we are prioritizing free education free antenatal, free delivery services, including cesarean for pregnant women. That's why we are prioritizing those areas that have never seen anything. The places that have never seen hospitals, we are building five general hospitals in areas that have never seen that before. Yes, we care for the downtrodden. When we say that these poor people, peasants, petty traders, and vulcanizers and hawkers should not be taxed anything, that's because of who we are. But guess what? There is a binding resource constraint. If you were to take the entire revenue of the state, what comes from Abuja, what we generate internally, and put them all together, and just put them, put them in this hall, and line up all the citizens of Anambra, and share it to them. My lords, by each person, each person's share, will come to about 2,800 and something naira a month. 2,000 naira, 800 and something naira a month. It is from that 2,800 and something per person, per month, that we've got to pay salaries, that you have to build roads, that you have to provide water, that you have to employ teachers, that you have to do this, that you have to do that, and pay pensioners, and pay all of those, all from the 2,800 and something naira, per person per month. 
This is what it comes down to. You can decide to bring it all and share to everybody. And so we shut down everybody. No road, no water, nothing else. And give each person 2,800. And what would that do for the person for the month? It is important that we get this context. That today, because of what we are doing and giving people value all over the state, property prices have shot up. They were telling me in Onisha that there are now places that it costs about a billion to buy a plot of land here in Onisha. People around uh, Oka North, where property prices used to be maybe one million or thereabout, a plot is now 15 million or thereabout. People are getting richer. Okada drivers are having money in their pockets and so on and so forth. That's how you manage the little resource you have. Otherwise, you bring it and share out and everybody goes home. And yet, everybody will be hungry. But all we say to you, Ndebai, Bona, with where we have been so far, we assure you of one thing, that every cobble, every cobble of Anambra's resource entrusted in our hands will be able to show you where it is going. We will show you where it is. And if we, are, if we ever borrow, if we borrow, and you do borrow when you have genuine reason, no business grows without borrowing. But not the kind of borrowing that I was the norm. We prioritize this, we spend the first, this first two years developing feasibility studies, project financing uh, capabilities, and so on. And when we borrow, we will show you the project that they go into and how those projects will pay back the money itself. We want to, it is not by accident that Anambra has now been adjudged among the top five states on fiscal sustainability in Nigeria. This has happened over the last two years. So, now that we have a handle on it, we will now move to the next steps. Now, I take you through just a few, just to give you some highlights. On security law and order, this has already been pointed out where we are. You knew where we were before we came in. And um, sustained response, at least, most of these eight local governments have been recovered. And uh, my name and um, uh, even after fighting all of those, you never, because it's a lucrative criminality, these guys have gone into the bush and they have seen the benefits of kidnapping for ransom. So occasionally you will still have these pockets of stuff ongoing, but we are determined to read a number of criminals and criminalities. The Truth and Justice Commission, we set up the Truth and Justice Commission to get to the remote and immediate causes of our insecurity in the Southeast and Anambra, led by Professor uh, Chido Dinkalo. They have just submitted a very seminal report, and I will tell you that is historic. And we are going to even discuss with our brothers in the rest of the Southeast for us to get into the reports, various volumes, because they get to the heat, to the heart of where we are and what we need to be doing going forward. But it's a long-term journey. We established, uh, of course, restructured our vigilante service. We established the anti touting the SASA, uh, which is now the fear of SASA in Indonesia. Is the beginning of wisdom for our house and so on and so forth. Uh, digital transformation in the justice uh, sector, uh, solar power courts, you know, small claims courts, bureau of missing persons, some executive bills that have been passed by our uh, very hardworking, uh, I mean, uh, House of Assembly. I must commend at this point the Speaker and members of the State House of Assembly being so patriotic and committed to the progress of our number of states. I also want to commend the Chief Judge and the Judiciary uh, for standing up. I understand this is the second, in terms of effectiveness or efficiency of the Judiciary, that ours is second only to Lagos in terms of the number of cases they try and judgments given every month. I want to commend you, uh, Judge, and uh, by, through you, to the members of the judiciary. We must also not end without thanking the members of the armed forces. 
the army, the police, the navy, the uh, GSS, the uh, civil defense, and they also are very able and I mean, uh, capable vigilante service. These people put their lives on the line so that we will be able to sleep. They have done quite so much, and I will continue um, to uh, appreciate you uh, going on. Now, I won't want to get into all of those on infrastructure. That has been said that about the extraordinary delivery of our infrastructural uh, development. Because when we came, you asked in their number on a needs assessment, what's your number one need? They will tell you is what? Roads. Number two, roads. Number three, roads. Before they come to the fourth one. And so we declared a state of emergency on roads. We faced a circumstance where complaints everywhere, this road, that road, the other one, and so on and so forth. But you know what? We decided that we're not going to play politics with this. Enough, because government all over lost credibility with the people because we kept lying to the people. We decided to do something different, and that is that why we prioritize this instead of coming to flag up a thousand roads when you have money to do only 10. And then erosion or fraud comes and then erosion develops in most of them. Everybody says this road was awarded, this one was awarded, this one. Even if you take the entire budget of the state into one local government, you will not finish doing their roads. But we prioritize very strategic roads that have interstate and intra-local government linkages that have taken you to those neglected, to the food producing baskets, so that far poor farmers can bring their goods to the market, and so on and so forth, and then to regenerate our urban areas. But so far, we've flagged off over 400 kilometers of roads, about 247 asphalted, but at a quality that our number has not seen before. And when we talk about subsequent stabilization with uh, stone bays before the thick asphalt, whenever we moved around on roads, I remember one bishop, an Anglican bishop during the synod, was pleading with me publicly, please, um, I should make sure to give them, to give our number the uh, quality of roads. Uh, because because tomorrow has to be better than today. We are now intentional about improving on that Ngege's quality of roads and give our number better than Ngege quality. <laughs> huh? But there is something more to it. We are delivering this at the least cost, completing and asphalting about 247 kilometers of road, ladies and gentlemen, that is record broken. It is not by accident that one of the major newspapers, I think they will be having the ceremony um, a few weeks to come, who declared us as the 2023 Governor of the Year in terms of infrastructural transformation. <laughs> At over 240 kilometers of road asphalted in 24 months, that comes to execution capacity of over 10 kilometers every month, every month that will happen in office. I can remember. We're not talking about the flyovers or the bridges and so on and so forth. And um, <laughs> anyway, the erosion projects that have been completed all over the place, the Benato Phase 1, um, coming to Phase 2, Nobi, Ezioko, um, Oka, behind the Kweme Square, and so on and so forth, even the federal highways. A zero pothole program is on course. And from late last year up until now, I understand they've measured it that about 392 kilometers of, uh, of road have been made motorable again, just by repairing the dead traps on many of these roads, uh, so to speak. It is an initial thing. And thereby, we are set. If you go to where we are having the Anambra Government House Governor's Lodge, you come to realize we are determined that as India Nambra, we are about the only state that I know, I don't know any other, that was created about 33 years ago 
where the governor lives in a different town and the capital is in another town. Where you still haven't got a functional government office or governor's office. In the Anambra, within the next few months, we will break that if it's a cost. After 33 years, Anambra is about having a befitting government house and governor's lodge here in Oka. Here in Oka. We are doing comprehensive modernization of the QMS Square. You won't, you won't recognize it again by the time you, I mean, end of, I mean, later part of this year. Reconstruction and upgrade of the Anambra State House of Assembly. Ongoing construction of the abandoned Oka shopping mall. 17 new commissioner, new buildings are going on for the commissioners. Uh, doing the Anambra uh, House in Lagos, renovation of Ministry of Justice, uh, outstations at the Newe, Onesho, Tuacha, and so on. Um, then, we are diversifying Anambra's energy mix. I'm glad, my Lord, you did mention about power. We are prioritizing power. In fact, when I came in, we set up the Anambra Power Committee now that it's now the law has been amended to give it used to be in the exclusive legislative list now it's now in the concurrent legislative list and i can bet you we now have a multi-stakeholder team working day by day for us to crack the power puzzle for anambra because as you rightly said we can't go where we want to go without having guaranteed power but you know what? We have learned something from our brother, Professor Barton Naji. Professor Barton Naji, I mean, I salute his courage, particularly courage. It takes a very courageous fellow. It took him 20 years, 20 years, and his company, Geometrics, to deliver the Aba Power project. We have learned from how he did it. And our team is working. No, it will not take that length of time. Anambra will within, I wouldn't begin to tell you, I know how long power, many people have talked about power in the country, promising, oh, within 10 months, it, to build one, to start one power plant and complete it, you probably need at least three years. To so start one and complete it, you need at least three years. Professor Barton Naji took him 20 to deliver uninterrupted power in Abia. What we can tell you is that it will take our number. I won't begin to tell you how many months or how many days and so on, because we will see power when we are ready with it. But beyond this, beyond this, we have gone on to now convert about 26,199 solar light for, uh, lamps into solar. We are moving also to solar. About 1,000 new solar street lights, solar in public offices, solar powered water schemes, and so on. And so we will be diversifying, which wouldn't just be the normal gas powered electricity, because today in Nigeria, because of the gas issue, you would have noticed. All over the country today, power supply has come down all over the country because essentially part of it is gas. Gas-powered uh, generation has been having problems in the country. We extended the electricity infrastructure to unserved and underserved areas, including places where we're heading to Nzam. We will get there, uh, by the way. Part of those places, jinx, that we are breaking, is that for the first time, the only local government in Nigeria that I know that you cannot drive to, the headquarters, the, the local government headquarters that you can't drive to, happen to be Anambra West. And by next week, we will be ready to drive to Nzam for the first time in history. We're also taking electricity there. We are not yet there, but we are intentional about making sure that it's not only that they are accessible, but we can also get there uh, with electricity. And then the uh, Aguilerio to, namely in Punando, Ezi Aguilerio and then Nubuotu, and so on. That 3 kV line has been taken to Umona, uh, 
uh, from Agbolo. And um, we are working on the um, regulatory policy framework to enable the private sector participation in the area of power. Uh, unfortunately, I think uh, Sir Michael for of EEDC will enter an MOU with EEDC. Uh, he was supposed to be, I think, uh, the issue about the flight uh, is not there. But we put all the stakeholders in one room, and I want to believe we'll be making fundamental progress in time to come. Again, there is history in the making. Massive statewide pipe bomb water schemes ongoing. I've talked about that in a moment. More below again, we will be going on the commissioning. Um, major urban water in Oka, Otuwa, Chane, Weo, Biziagwata, and Greater Onesha will soon be fully operational. And then test runs already ongoing in these places. We also have some other uh, ones in our, uh, uh, take up in Agolo, Okozo, Umunze, Okosi and so on and so forth, and rehabilitating and converting about 75 rural water schemes to get on. Even in the 70s, in Onesha, you fetch public, uh, public water. But I'm sure those in their uh, 20s and 30s don't know what it looks like. But I can bet you that that has been broken. Development and rehabilitated water schemes uh, where our firefighting capability is being enhanced, emergency response, at least we've gotten now to about 96% emergency uh, response capability, and that is going on. And let me also tell you, China were intentionally embarking on urban regeneration program, regeneration of furniture, because furniture literally died and our people are moving over across the river in search of greener and more habitable place. But I want to report to you on the Anambra. Somebody said it the day we went to commission for Takot Road, Niger Street, that this man promised us Dubai, Taiwan. He came, Pidogodi, Pochagota. Pochasia, Gota, Miliwe, Babapana River, Niger. He was just describing it in his own understanding, the step by step that we are taking to recover our place. Because by two years ago, when it rained, the entire uh, Onisha South and much of Onisha got flooded. Water flood will get to people almost getting to drowning point. And in one secondary school, they confessed to us that two years earlier, three of their students died, were drowned after rain. But now we've opened that up, opened back Wangene, and opened the channel back again for the first time now in over a decade or so. Runoff water flooding can now get back into the River Niger. And we are now intentionally rebuilding Onesha. Today, like I said, Ochanja Roundabout is no longer a refuse dump. It's now a water fountain. And that is the way we make the message. But while we are regenerating the existing ones, Onesha is the biggest industrial commercial city in the southeast. Onesha will be in the Ibo. There's nobody from southeast and so on that somebody from his kindred doesn't live in Onesha. Because if Onesha doesn't work, Anambra cannot work. If Onesha doesn't work, southeast economy cannot work. This is the largest market in West Africa. And so we are very, very intentional on getting this. Orca is gradually looking like a state capital. Orca is gradually looking like a state capital. Yes, and we are very intentional about it. One of the bridges that are being constructed beyond the globe or so on is the one that connects the two parts of Orca across the express. That is also ongoing now. And the by while we are regenerating the existing cities, we are intentional about acquiring land and putting them in land bank, planning them into the cities of the twenty not just of the twenty first century, but of the twenty second century. Anambra's landmass is the smallest after Lagos. If we don't plan today 
Anambra will soon get fully built up as a chaotic ghetto. And so, we are planning three brand new cities. The designs already being completed. Oka 2.0 from Millennium City going all the way through Ndu Kwenu to up to the Mamu Forest thing. You need to see the design. I'm sure now some of us will wish to reincarnate again. Now back I gave it. On Nisha 2.0, the other side of the, the second Niger Bridge. And then the industrial city that Christ, part of Aguata, Oboji, Gawato, uh, part of Orumba, North Orumba South, so now about over 4,000 hectares of land. Mahindra, the global consulting firm on industrialization and industrial policy, has completed the, the design and, and feasibility study for that. That will be the next new axis of prosperity in terms of industrialization. So, our housing infrastructural development on 214 hectares of land in Aguaba and so on and so forth. So, these new cities is in the new industrial city. Revised feasibility study for Anambra Automotive Industrial Park. Completion of feasibility for the special agro processing zone. Feasibility for our pharmaceutical manufacturing zone and feasibility for the export emporium. These are now set, and we will be exploring alternative funding mix to kick them off for that Anambra of our dream. The groundbreaking for the industrial city will happen in no distant time. We've completed the Anambra in, uh, transport master plan, and this transportation master plan includes the one on transportation, Yes, we now have the master plan for Anambra's rail system. That has now been completed, and we are going to come on board about it. We are discussing with possible financiers. We put together the financing, Mana and Mangwakono, for the rail to work. If again, something must give. Because there's this woman at Nobi when I went on a campaign and I was talking about possibility of a flyover at um, Apo, Nobi. The woman, Kwaka, 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 said, Oma Kapao, come here, me to go shop. <laughs> so, what I'm saying to you in the Anambra, the rail is nice. We are looking at all the options. One of the options that will go internally in the hinterland will require massive, over 5,000 buildings will have to give way. But, this is the kind of conversation we are going to have as a people. This is the kind of conversation we must have with our people. But let me tell you, the other two parts of this, uh, this process is that we now have a master plan also for our water transportation system. And yes, the very critical one is for our road infrastructure. The best time to have, the, the very first time, best time to have planned our transportation master plan was maybe 50 years ago. Now everywhere is being fully built up. Many, almost all the federal roads in Anambra need to be dualized if we are thinking about the next generations. If we are thinking 50, 100, 200 years, all the federal roads in Anambra and all the trunk A state roads in Anambra need to be dualized for people to be able to move on. Because in the by, let me share with you, by 2070, we estimate that you'll have about 38 million people here in this tiny piece of land called Anambra. People, it will be impossible for anybody to move around. Impossible. And this administration is determined. Yes, there is a saying that politicians worry about the next election, but statesmen worry about next generation. We are very intentional worrying about 
what happens the next 50 years, the next 100 years, the next 200 years. That's how other countries were built. That's how Dubai was built. That's how Taiwan was built. That's how America was built. They thought thousand years to come, how will it look like? And you start planning today. It's not when you get there, then you start talking. Today, you find people trading on the streets and so on and so forth. We need a master plan, and we have now developed the master plan for rail, for land, transportation, and for water transportation. It's now changing gear to execution. And then, yes, Onisha Port is now been um, recognized as a port of destination and a port of origin. We are working with the concessionaire. And I know there, Anambra will regain its pride of place as the hub for logistics and for commerce. <laughs> Petrol powered vehicles to CNG and so on, upskilling in the Anambra in transport hardware and maintenance, innovations towards efficient traffic management. You can see that all over the state. Um, Atma, um, not comfortable for a lot of people, but we must do that. Um, people running one way and so on and so forth, they don't want this to happen. We must have a state of law and uh, order. And that is the only way, again, people can move around within the sustained little thing that we have. We are interventions and modernizing our markets. Yes, my lord, you mentioned coconut and palm revolution. Our target here is simple. Our target, we have already planted about 1,140,000. We've distributed the seedlings to about 130,000 households. Our target is to be distributing a minimum of 1 million seedlings every year. We are now started the procurement for this year's own. Another 1 million seedlings will be distributed this year. Our target is to be able to distribute between 5 million to 10 million over a period of time. You can imagine when they are all grown, Anambra will be green. It will help with erosion control. And yes, any family that has about 10, 15 of those seedlings, not just them to maturity, a poor household in that will be permanently out of poverty. And we are looking forward to a new industrial ecosystem to process these commodities into whether exports or for local domestic consumption. There is a silent revolution going on in there. They call it the new Michael Obara's uh, regime. And then we are preserving the endangered Igbo cash crops, species such as Okwa, Oji, Aquino, Bitacola, Popo, and so on. We have ordered for hundreds of thousands of these this year. We will also be distributing them. We must regenerate and get this thing back on track again. We are distributing other endangered uh, species and so on and so forth. Now, supporting all year round rice production uh, going on at Ifito Gwari, train of agricultural extension officers where we trained about 150 that have now trained over 20,000 others. And what the yield that this is growing from about 7,000, uh, 7 tons to over 30 tons per hectare in some pilot cases. That's how we're going to be promoting agriculture. Anambra will change from just being a departure lounge to being a destination point. And we are intentional about this. Agolo. We had a mighty project we are going to kick off in Agolo, but we are delayed and distracted by issues of land and so on, which has now been recently resolved. But before that got resolved, because ours is an agenda with a deadline, we couldn't stay and wait. We moved that and then about 12 hectares of land here at the heart of the city. We are developing the Fun City. The Fun City that promises to be the largest three in one fun and entertainment city in West Africa where you have the water park, the amusement park, the country club, and so on and so forth, all in one location, the biggest of it in West Africa, and this will be completed this year. The neighborhood park, we are doing that, cultural renaissance on track, yes, we talked about education, we are coming to that in a second, but we cannot have 
smart schools, smart education without having smart teachers. And so, and that is our mantra is technology everywhere and everything technology. And we're very deliberate about creating, orchestrating what we call the digital tribe in Anambra. And so besides recruiting 5,000 teachers and another 3,000 being under recruitment process ongoing exclusively through competitive process, we also want to enable them with a cutting edge technology and skills because you can't give what you don't have. If you are a teacher, you can't give what you don't have. But the quality of school resides in the quality of teachers and the quality of teaching. And so we are prioritizing teachers in schools and the quality of teachers and with the supervision to ensure quality teaching as well. Anambra will continue to be the leader in this area. You cannot have a, a Taiwan of Africa without having solid education that is cutting edge, but that we are coming under to. Yes, on innovation, innovation and digital economy, the peer review by, I think, um, the National uh, Innovation and Digital Economy Council comprising all the states met, peer review, and they all rated Anambra as the overall best state in digital technology development. We came second runner up in tech in human capital, best state in digital infrastructure tech development, and first runner up in e-government implementation. This is the states themselves rating each other. And that number came up on that. I don't need to say much more about that. Initiated investment in fiber optic for the, my, for the last mile connection. Solution Wi-Fi initiatives in some public spaces already coming and uh, citizen engagement. About 17 local governments are now being connected. The digital Anambra State Health Facilities Management Unit, now digitalized, and our GIS, Geographic Information Management System. Soon, it will be able to have digitally enabled process of land administration that people should be able to obtain and change their certificates of occupancy. Our target is to be able to get that. Now it's about a week from months in the past, but our target is to be able to get it to a maximum of 72 hours, and that is ongoing as we speak. Anambra Silicon Valley, the digital tribe, level up Anambra, where about 20,000 of our youths have been trained in the basics of uh, ICT uh, techniques. And uh, SID currently, uh, Code Anambra is ongoing, and uh, about 2,000, uh, little over 2,000 uh, people are undergoing that training, free of charge. Costs millions for people to go through that kind of course in some other private enterprises, but we are partnering with some others and providing over 2,000 on their number of youths with this. And um, for temporary SID, the Solution Innovation District, is out there off and running, and every day hundreds of people are going there to learn digital skills. And guess what? We're also prioritizing to build our own what we'll promise to be a number of Silicon Valley. Where you have the current government house, 13 hectares of land from there down were devoting it to become the innovation district, the solution innovation district. And the, its iconic first building is, will be doing the groundbreaking next week or two. <laughs> Investing in our greatest asset, which is our human capital. Human capital is our greatest asset. We've mentioned this about education. We want to value that enough. Education, education, education. Our human capital is our greatest asset. And therefore, we are prioritizing health and education and leveling up with a digital school. Like you said, 5,000 teachers recruited, 3,000 being processed, and 2,000 laptops were distributed on Monday, and more to come. Um, and then, this Getting the poor to have access to qualitative education 
is the only way to level up opportunities. The difference between the children of the rich and the children of the poor is opportunity. If you give the children of the poor the same opportunity as the children of the rich, I bet you the children of the poor might have the possibility of leveling up and overtaking the children of the rich. Much of the country, we have been creating dynasties of poverty. We are the children, for me, growing up. I attended the same primary school. The children of the rich and the poor attended the same primary school taught by the same teacher. Not anymore. Today, the children of the rich attend top-notch private elite schools. And the children of the poor, especially the poorest of the poor, are condemned in poorly resourced public schools. And therefore, where they get little or no learning outcomes, and they end up with nothing garbage in, garbage out, they end up themselves being poor with little opportunity in life. And their own children end up also being poor. So poverty becomes a dynasty in a particular house. And though the only way they escape from poverty is through criminality, we must end this, these dynasties of poverty, by providing qualitative, accessible education to the poor in particular. Here, I thank, I want to appreciate the, the church, the Catholic, the Anglicans, the Pentecostals, the Salvation Army, for investing in education. Keep up the good job in terms of what we are doing. We'll continue to support to the extent that we can. But we are very deliberate about that the system is as strong as the weakest link. The weakest link in our educational system today is public sector provided education system. So why we encourage and support the public sector education, I mean the mission schools, we also have to be deliberate about government schools because it is the primary government, job of government to provide this. And so we are working very hard on this and um, with our, poly, um, our free education thing and we are getting teachers to all day schools now. Enrollment has gone up to about almost 19% now in public schools. And um, as we also, we are upscaling about 60 schools to become smart schools. Our public-private partnership is at work. Private individuals are also investing now in our school and hearkening to our call for them to invest in this. We we'll have won several, we we'll continue to win national and international recognitions. Our people, when their number continue to represent the country in national and international quiz and debating competitions and bringing home laurels. And for the mission schools, it's important to underscore that I, I mean, uh, that there is a boom. That's what I have been told, the boom by government in terms of our support for mission schools. A few months ago, we no doubt about 1.524 billion as grant to return mission schools, and then another 700 million for mission tertiary institutions, bringing it about 2.22 billion um, to mission schools. But then we must also point out, oh, for the first time in history as well, uh, the schools owned by the Pentecostals received grant from the state. And point out that in the recruitment that we did for primary schools, 80% of the teachers who recruited for primary schools went to mission schools, mission return schools. And we pay for all these teachers plus the old ones that we have as we speak currently, even before the minimum wage and consequential adjustment, it cost the state about a billion a month to pay salaries of teachers that are in the mission schools. Um, so to speak. We broke the jinx about UBEC counterpart funding that has now delivered some billions to um, ASUBEP and with which they are now implementing a massive um, uh, upgrading of primary schools. We've launched free antenatal and free delivery services that has just grown up. About 42,076 women have received or are receiving free antenatal here in Anambra. And every month, from an average of about 200 women, that delivered in public hospitals in the past. We now have thousands of them, and 
44% of these women who deliver free of charge, including free caesarean operations in Anambra, are not in the Anambra. Very important to underscore that. And I think I understand now your disease, and I'm about to tell number of people who are not free. Come on, I see you move on. You're not moving. You're not moving. You're not moving. Health access to neglected communities. We are building five general hospitals, and guess what? All these five general hospitals are in the communities that are large enough but don't have health facilities or in local governments that never had general hospitals. And all these five general hospitals are in the Anambra North Senatorial Zone. The governor comes from the south, the deputy is from central. But we are intentional about extending these services to the people where they are needed the most. Anambra West will get a general hospital, Enugu to Aguilera will get a general hospital, then you come to um, uh, Anako in um, uh, Aya Melum, then you, nobody will believe that Onisha South never had a general hospital, and of course Opoko. We're building five brand new general hospitals and refurbishing, we have finished refurbishing three of them, we will be commissioning uh, in a few days uh, to come. And in the era of hospitals without medical personnel, we have employed over a thousand health professionals in our hospitals and so on. Uh, primary health centers, over 326 of them being renovated with solar equipment and so on, and the introduction of telemedicine that you connect them um, from a call center. Every Once you have access to a primary health center, you have access to a doctor through the call centers and so on and so forth. We have, you know, cervical center for screening for women, general hospitals that were refurbishing and so on and so forth. I would just emergency medical services, medical oxygen production plants and endoscopy at Onisha, enhanced disease surveillance, drug quality control. We distributed about 3.8 million mosquito nets a few um, in 2022 when we came in. Healthcare infrastructure, sexually transmitted gender-based violence, and so on and so forth. Yes, one youth, two skin. Uh-oh. Ah. Uh, no, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is a unique program that I think we are mainstreaming, and I think the rest of country, the rest of the country has something to learn from this. This is rooted in the Igbo apprenticeship uh, training and mentorship uh, scheme, uh, where we we'll train them in two skills, basic trade skill, then entrepreneurship skill, and then we we'll empower them with about two billion and another 2.5 billion available for concessional loans to them. Um, and then reinventing and mainstreaming of our sports, um, sports economy all over um, Anambra now. Then, governance and value system. We are getting to the end of it. It's important to underscore this, that what underpins our agenda is this one people, one agenda philosophy in governance. Yes. We are one people, one state, one people, one agenda. We are prioritizing the fact that Yes, Anambra, predominantly, probably 99% uh, Christian uh, state. But then you needed to bring everybody together. I'm very happy as I look around here. This was supposed to, this is a mass service. But I look out there and I see the bishops. Unfortunately, today coincides with the day that they are... Um, uh, ordaining, I mean, I think four bishops of the Anglican Communion, so all the Anglican bishops uh, are not uh, here. They had to excuse themselves. But it is fair to say that if I get on to the preaching of the, uh, the papacy on ecumenism, that we are one body with a Bible in the body of Christ, we are one. 
and we've tried to preach this all over and reflected it both in the character and the form of our administration that somebody said to me that interdenominational tension that existed for over 20 years that in one a few months you've been able to bring it to next to zero as it were and to the point that the ccc the anglican uh, methodist and so on uh, wing of Khan had to give us a very special award as father of ecumenism and the pentecostal fellowship agreed and to give that to a catholic like me an orthodox one at that says volume about the way that we have tried to unify the state and bring down this tension down so that we can focus on the process of transformation of the state. Competence is the primary consideration. Confident, confidence is the primary consideration as we do recruitment and appointment in public service. Without regard to state of origin, ethnicity, religion, denomination, or political party. Recently, we just appointed the uh, permanent secretaries.